the 2.45 miles of Mostport Park in Ontario, Canada. A circuit designed to test even the champions among those who come here. He's just 27 years of age, the winner of this year's first Trans Am round at Miami back in February. Tom Kendall has more road racing experience than veterans twice his age. In 1990, he drove a Chevrolet to the series championship. Today, he settles a Ford from the prestigious Jack Roush stables. 1989 was the year that saw Dorsey Schrader claim this most prestigious championship in American road racing. That year's Trans Am belonged to Ford, and like his younger competitor, the always aggressive Schrader has elected to maintain his allegiance to Ford in this year's Trans Am series. It's been since 1978 that Greg Pickett hosted a series championship, yet he and his trusty Chevrolet are continuing the search for number two. Pickett's covered more miles, slid through more turns, competed at more tracks, and set more records than anyone else in today's Trans Am field. Driving last year's championship car is the 1987 Trans Am Series champion, Scott Pruitt. Back then, he drove a Roush Mercure. He tried Indy cars for a while. Now he's part of the two-car Chevrolet team of Buzz McCall. His partner in crime, Jack Baldwin, longtime Chevrolet advocate and winner of the 1992 Trans Am Series Championship. Baldwin brings a, pardon me please, coming through attitude to this series, reminiscent of what you'd see from old time flat track drivers. Five champions, each searching for the magic that once brought them glory. Each ready to answer the challenges of one of the toughest courses ever built. As they and 20 other drivers compete for the honors today, in the SCCA High and Zells Trans Am Championship. No, it's not the Stars and Stripes. It's the Maple Leaf of Canada. We're north of the border for the second round of the 1994 SCCA Trans Am Championship Series here on Prime. Hello again, everyone. I'm Rick Benjamin. Great to have you with us today here at Mostport Park. If you were with us back in February at Miami when the 94 season kicked off, you saw a Tom Kendall benefit event. Kendall started on the pole in his Roush Mustang and checked out. No one could stay close to him. Since then, all the other teams have been busy testing, and the SCCA has been busy as well, trying to even up the competition. They've taken little away from the Fords and tried to give a little more to the Chevrolets for the second round of the 1994 Series Championship. Great to have you with us on Prime. And for more on those technical changes, my colleague on these broadcasts, champion driver Bill Adam, had a chance to go down in the pit area earlier and see what's going on. The SECA worked very hard on mandating equality in the Trans Am Series. And under the skin of these two cars, the cars are remarkably equal. Both the Ford Mustang and Chev Camaro have identical 310 cubic inch motors of about 630 horsepower. Both cars run a five-speed transaxle, and both cars weigh 2,725 pounds. But beyond that, the similarities end. It becomes aerodynamics. Last year, Chevrolet unveiled the swoopy new Camaro that a lot of people felt may have an advantage on the long straights, where the Ford drivers, by their own admission, felt like it was trying to push a brick through the air. Well, this year, the new Mustang was unveiled at Miami. This car, the car of Tom Candle, sat on the pole and went on to win the race. But perhaps Perhaps too handily, as the SCCA felt it was more than just Kendall's wonderful talent that gave him the victory. It might have been aerodynamics. And here at Mostport, a high-speed track, they've made a change. The hood is now lowered to decrease some of that wonderful front-end traction the Mustang has enjoyed. And to give the Camaro some more front-end traction, they've given them a change also. Under the front end, they've now allowed the addition of a one-inch splitter, should they choose to use it. What a splitter does is to add downforce on the front end by extending an aluminum plate out here to stop air spilling under the car. This, in effect, gives the car more front downforce. And on the back end of the car, maybe a change that's even more progressive. And that's a spoiler change. The rear spoiler has to maintain a height of six inches, but it had to follow the contour of the body line. As the Camaro's swoopy rear fender curved down, so did the spoiler. Now they can run the six inch height all the way across, and with the scoop effect of the spoiler, it tends to channel a lot more air in and give the car a lot more downforce. But how does all this translate into the on-track performance? Well, let's hear it from the drivers themselves. It didn't do much to the Ford. I don't think it did much to us at all. It definitely gave the Chevrolet a lot of downforce that they obviously needed, uh, front and rear both. Um, 
it's you know it's yet to be seen what that's going to be i hear it most for you know aerodynamic track those guys are going fast i think they'd have been going fast anyway i feel like the ford has such a big advantage that what they took away from the ford really was, was like giving us the splitter the splitter didn't do anything for us and what they took away from the ford didn't hurt them they came with a lot so as you can see, two of the past champions in this series have widely divergent opinions on those technical changes in their cars. Covering pit road for us today here at Mosport Park will be Chris McClure. Chris? Rick, the whole field is represented with a Pontiac, a Dodge, and a couple of Oldsmobiles, but they're way back there. The clear battle lines are between the Ford Mustang and the Chevrolet Camaro. Now, first blood on the season was drawn at Miami when this man, Tom Kendall, came up with the pole and won it wire to wire. Back then, the margin on the qualifying, Tom, was a second. Here, it's a good deal closer. Don't mean to suggest Miami was easy, but these guys are going to be able to be all over you a little more, perhaps. I'll tell you what, it couldn't be all over me much more than the finish at Miami. You know, the three cars covered by a blanket, but uh, we've done a lot of testing in the offseason. The grid's extremely close here. We've got a new sponsor in All Sport Body Quencher. I'd like to give them a good run and just, uh, you know, keep on truck trucking. You know, winds are tough to come by. I'd love to get a couple early on. Okay, Tom Kendall, he starts from the pole. Now, consider this. Back at Miami, the best qualified Chevy Camaro was a second and a half back. That piloted by Scott Pruitt. He's now perched on the front row. Scott Pruitt, 13 hundredths of a second off Tom Kendall's qualifying. The rules and some other things have closed the gap. Can you shoot it out now with the Mustangs? Uh, we still got a long ways to go. <laughs> you can see I'm just surrounded by Mustangs up here, but the Royal Oak Camaro, it's, it's doing a good job. We're going to run them hard all day long. It's going to be a long day. It's going to be a hot day, and so it's going to be real critical on tires, and like I said, we'll run them hard, and we'll make the best of our Camaro all day long. Scott Pruitt. He ran here in 86 and 87 and won in Trans Am. He's now with the team that's won the last three races here, a formidable combination. Pruitt and Kendall door-to-door -door into turn one ought to be a great battle. Round two of the 1994 SCCA Trans Am Championship being brought to you today by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? We'll be back at Most Ford Park after these commercials. Back at Most Ford Park, just east of Toronto. Fantastic day for automobile racing. 25 Trans Am drivers and crews and cars about ready to get down to it. One of the drivers who has quite a history here at Most Ford Park. In fact, he's from this area, has won here before Chris McClure with Ron Fellows. Saw his first races at this track as a youngster, cut his racing teeth here, and won one of these races in 1989. Ron Fellows, you're well qualified. A couple of hot shoes right in front of you. Is patience a virtue on this day? Well, that is going to be the game plan, uh, Chris. Uh, I think the weather's a lot hotter than we all anticipated, perhaps. Uh, being smart with tires is going to be especially critical here. Uh, and hopefully my uh, race, uh, the things that I've learned how to do here, uh, of all the races I've done and where I grew up here, it'll pay off. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Like you say, I, have, I won here in 89 and haven't had much luck since, but uh, the Tom Goy team has put together a great Mustang for me. And uh, this is my best opportunity since then to do that. Okay, he's on the outside of row number two, the Canadian, Ron Fellows. And he's a driver a lot of folks here will be cheering for in his AER Ford Mustang today. Fellows always a very, very strong competitor. All 25 of these drivers really have their work cut out for them this afternoon at Mostport because this is one of the most challenging courses you'll find anywhere in the world. At the bottom of your screen, you see the straightaway here, the Andretti straight. It's neither straight nor is it flat, yet these drivers tell me they're going to try very, very hard to, to make their passes at the end of this straightaway going into turn seven and eight in fact it's going to be such an incredible challenge for these drivers we sent my colleague bill adam out on the course earlier bill expects the trans am drivers to have quite an afternoon here and in just a couple of moments that trans am field is going to appear behind us over this blind brow they'll take the green flag they'll come down through turn one down a short straight and all of a sudden they're going to have the edge of the earth right in front of them because this is the infamous turn two of Mosport. A corner that Jackie Stewart has called the most difficult, the most dangerous corner in the world. And the problem is here. And behind us, the world drops away. The cars are at speeds of over 135 miles an hour as they crest the hill, and they want to get light. Gravity is working against them. They want to slide to the outer edge of the pavement, and they can't put down the horsepower. They have to be patient and exercise caution right here because the danger is evident. 
Further around the track, we have this beautiful area called Moss Corner. Once again, these cars will be at speeds of over 130 miles an hour as they go down through the forest at the heaviest braking point and coming all the way down to 35 miles an hour for the hairpin. Extreme judgment and decision is required here because they have to carry a lot of speed out onto that back straight. Now, a person of no less bravery than a past champion like Jack Baldwin has called this place scary. To him, the ultimate roller coaster ride. And it's going to be a ride for all of us today as we enjoy this great Trans Am event. Chris, back to you. Bobby Archer accepts that challenge from fifth grid position. Well qualified, the fourth Mustang in the Fast Five. And Bobby Archer, after the qualifying, your race setup test was wiped out. A bad wheel puts you on the side of the road for the warm-up. How much a deficit is that? Well, it's really not much. You know, we were going to put another cycle on the tires, but, uh, you know, I got them up to, up to temp, and then they cut short. But actually, that left us with more rubber for the race, so we're looking pretty good. Okay, Bobby Archer, along with his racing brother Tommy in the field, they could challenge, Rick. Of course, the Archer brothers certainly will be among the strong contenders here this afternoon at Mostport Park. Tommy Kendall, our pole qualifier, picking up $2,500, $1,000 of that, the Ray Bestis Pole Award to Tom Kendall, who sits on the inside of row one. Scott Pruitt, we already talked with him. He'll be on the outside of that first row. Let's take you through the starting lineup. Dorsey Schrader and Ron Fellows, two of the Tom Gloy cars, will make up row two today. Third row, Bobby Archer, we heard from him. Past champion Jack Baldwin and the other Buzz McCall Chevrolet. Boris Said, former showroom stock champion. And Tommy Archer in the fourth row. Past series champ Greg Pickett. George Robinson, who's won in this series in row five. Paul Genalozzi, the leader of the Rocket Sports Bunch in row six. And his young teammate Jamie Gallus. Row seven, Ray Kong and John Gooding in another Ford. The eighth row, Bill Saunders, one of the Archer Brothers cars. And Rick McCormick. Tim McAdam in the series now. And Bob Patch, the only Pontiac driver. Tenth row, Randy Ruhlman in the only Dodge. And Brian Richards from Canada. R.J. Valentine and Rick Dittman in one of the Oldsmobiles, the eleventh row. Donald Sack, the other Olds driver. And Dale Phelan from South Carolina. Carolina, row 13, Clint Welding will go shotgun on the field here at Most Sport Park. Signal coming down from the SCCA Pro Racing staff. It's time to fire the motors and move out. We'll have a couple of pace laps and be ready to go green at Most Sport after these commercial messages. Being born a woman means being born with special needs. The Women's Health Center at Palmdale Hospital Medical Center addresses the special needs of women in a gentle, caring way designed specifically for women. On the average, women live seven to eight years longer than men. Field getting ready to take the green flag to get this one underway. After one race, there's your top five at points. Tom Kendall leading, of course. He won, led flag to flag at Miami. Dorsey Schrader, Scott Pruitt, Jack Baldwin, Ron Fellows rounding out the top five. You get a point for leading and also a point for qualifying on the pole. So Tom Kendall has already picked up an additional point before we go green today. One of the team owners who makes this such a great series, Buzz McCall, operates the two cars for Scott Pruitt and Jack Baldwin, the past series champion. Actually, two former champions. Chris McClure is with McCall. He's just sent those two gentlemen into battle, and if either one of them bring home a first-place finish, it will be four in a row for the AER team. Kind of a nice prospect. It is. Uh, this is one of the toughest, one of the fastest tracks in North America, and uh, one that's going to require a lot of patience, that's for sure. You're nervous? I'm always nervous. Buzz McCall, he's got two good ones out there running. Two of the greatest. Bill Adam, you've driven with Buzz McCall. He's got plenty of experience here and elsewhere. An 84-degree day with not much humidity, uh, just light winds and clear blue skies. What more could you ask for? This is really a perfect day at this track, and it's a track that has always been difficult because you really don't get any place to rest here. Even on this uphill straight, you are curving, as we can see right now. That's the straight we're looking at, and it's not <laughs> much like the straight you picture when you think of a track. So it's a track that's physically demanding, and anytime the temperature gets up, it just exaggerates that problem. Now the rise that the drivers are concerned about back here, right around the seventh corner, the cars will be lifting a little as they come up this hill that we're looking at right now. Yeah, we're going to see right there at the top of the picture, that's a hump the cars will be cresting 164 to 166 miles per hour. And as they come over right there, they pop over the top. They can't help but get up at the upper limits of the suspension and they get air underneath the car, so they float. Dorsey Schrader told us earlier after the driver's meeting today, he's a little concerned about what may happen in the first few laps before the 
the field starts to sort out when there are seven or eight cars in a bunch going over that part of the racetrack. The biggest problem is that these fellas will still be on cold tires and they're unnaturally nervous cars. So you want to keep them as quiet as possible for the first part. As Bill described earlier, about 630 or 40 horsepower, 2,700 pound cars around turn 10 here at Mosport up the very short main straightaway. And Kendall and Pruitt lead them to Oh, there's an accident. There's trouble already. A couple of cars into the wall. One of the Archer Brothers cars and one of the Ginsana cars were under green. The green automobile there, the car uh, being driven today by Tim McAdam. And one of the Archer Brothers cars, that's Bill Saunders, Highway Master automobile, getting into it right at the start. Saunders able to continue. The leaders on the back portion of the course already through two and three. And Tom Kendall and Scott Pruitt leading the program at the moment. I won't be surprised. You're going to see a red flag perhaps to stop this field and we may get a restart because that looks too badly damaged to pull it out of the way quickly. Here they are. We're going to get a replay of just exactly what happened and watch the red car right there in the middle of the picture. See what takes place. There's the green. Look at him heading towards the wall. Slams hard into the wall. Let, just me, let me correct it. It is Jamie Gallus rather than McAdam, although McAdam was involved in that too. The two cars starting together. They could have had Saunders in a sandwich there. Boy, Saunders did not have a chance to avoid that at all. You're coming out of that last turn, turn 10, putting down six 100 plus horsepower and you're accelerating suddenly to get the roadblock ahead of you. Watch the left side of the screen. He, there's the car, out of control already. Hard into the wall. He rebounds out in the path and it is nailed by Saunders. Jamie Gallus from a great racing family moving to the Trans Am Tour after a great series in the Atlantic Series. He's had a lot of experience in open-wheel cars. Gallus's car stopped there on the main straightaway. Chris McClure is standing by. Ray Kong just did get out of the car a moment ago. The pace car signal has gone up on the flag stand, and the field slows down as they get back to the front straightaway. And I'm being shooed away by SCCA people. They tried to push Ray Kong's car away, and the bodywork is so badly damaged and pinched in on the tires, they simply couldn't move it. They're going to have to get a hook out here, so it's going to delay everything. The car of Ray Kong, the car that is stopped on the course. We thought it was 67. It's car number 87, the car being driven by Ray Kong. So we've described who Jamie Gallus is to you, but Gallus not involved in the spill. Kong, rather, from San Jose, a driver with great experience. He was the other Jensen car that was involved there in that spill. Yes, Ray does have a lot of experience, although unfortunately not in these cars, but that had nothing to do with the incident that just took place. He simply was in, in a bad place at the wrong time, and it's, it was not his fault by all the appearances that we saw. Just ran out of road, really, at the start there. As the field is slowing down now under caution, apparently a full course caution here at Most Board Park, just off the green flag. Tom Kendall and Scott Pruitt will have to gather it back up and go back to green in a few moments. We're going to take a timeout at Most Board Park. Bowmanville, Ontario, the field under caution. Coming down for the green flag, there was a crash right at the start-finish line. Tom Kendall being posted as the leader as we circulate under full course caution. Driver with a car most heavily damaged, Ray Kong, and Chris McClure ready to talk with him. His car just being pulled up the straightaway now. Ray, reconstruct that for us, would you? Well, when the field came up for the starter, uh, the, the whole field kind of slowed down. So I went around. I had already started to be on the gas a little bit. I had went around, uh, tried to go to the right of the car in front of me, uh, got into the brakes a little bit too hard, came around because I already had some steering input into it. Uh, it was an unfortunate deal. Um, uh, the crew worked really hard, and the, the Gensana Sunsource Camaro was just doing. You know, we were we were real happy with our qualifying. Uh, the Rocket Sports crew did a great job, and, uh, and it's really unfortunate that something like this uh, would have to happen. Okay, Ray Kong, he didn't even make it to the stripe, fellas. A disappointing day. The Saunders car is getting attention in the pits, but I'm not at all sure they can fix that either. Saunders able to move around under caution, Bill Adam, but he's lost a couple of laps already in the lap count. Yeah, it really is unfortunate that, that the fact was that it was an experience to cause this accident. Ray Kong was good to admit that indeed he had got on the gas too early, and he was just the author of his own misfortune. Unfortunately, the downside of all that is it has taken two excellent cars out of the race. You know, there's a point that was brought up since he did not even make the starting line. Is he qualified as a starter of the race? Could be that uh, SECA timing and scoring will have to sort that one out before the afternoon is over. We're under caution here at Mostport Park right off the start. We're watching the best sedan racing in North America today. Trans Am undeniably the most nationally acclaimed SCCA event, but the core of SCCA is its amateur competition. We're going to bring you an SCCA racing update from Chrysler. Chrysler's looking to promote its all-new Neon as 
the car of choice on the highway and also at the raceway. They've committed to nearly a quarter of a million dollar contingency program to help the amateur competitors in SCCA club racing. The SCCA's amateur ranks have responded incredibly well. Now this is a look at SCCA solo competition where drivers race against the clock around the course in a parking lot that's marked by pylons. And the odds nimble handling and potent motor has already proven to be a winning combination with drivers in SCCA solo competition. A lot of fun for the amateurs who compete in solo. Neon racing is spoken on the road courses. The cars quickly found its way to victory circle in club racing's competitive showroom stock C category. This is a recent amateur event at Blackhawk Farms, a club circuit just outside Chicago. The neon paddock area full of competitors as they were getting ready for their competition at Blackhawk Farms on this particular day. The paddock reserved for neons just chock full of folks getting ready for their upcoming event. The neons appear innocent on the street, but under racing conditions, they're extremely competitive, already taking first place at many national and regional events across the country. Overnight, the Neon has become a new SCCA club racing favorite, as we see at Blackhawk Farms. Under caution here at Mosport Park, round two of the 1994 SCCA Trans Am Tour. Looking to get the green flag and really get this one underway. We've run a couple of laps under caution. We'll be back for the restart in a moment. I want to congratulate Jeff Tippy of Bellingham, Washington, the winner of our Bahamas Getaway Vacation. We told you about that back in Miami at the end of February here on Prime, and a lot of folks entered. We appreciate all those who sent us cards. Jeff Tippy wins the Bahama Getaway. Uh, given away just a short time ago from Miami to the Bahamas. Jeff and a guest will take a nice week-long trip, and he'll thoroughly enjoy that. We wish Jeff and his friend uh, all the best as they get set to enjoy a Bahamas getaway. Bill Adam, we're trying to enjoy an SCCA Trans Am round, round two of the 94 Championship Series here on Prime. These drivers, what does this do to a driver to get a green flag, then get a full course caution? They haven't really done any racing yet. No, if anything, it's going to be a plus for them right now because they've had a chance to warm their tires up a little bit. They didn't just get the single pace lap they had before. So now, when the race does restart, the cars are much more close to a full race condition for them. They've had a couple of laps to settle down, and they're just about ready for a green flag condition. And the green is back out. 30 seven laps remaining of this 40 lap event we marked three under caution Kendall down into turn one Scott Pruitt running along in second spot the Mustangs starting to give chase now and work on Tommy Kendall just a little bit Kendall one of the great road racers there's Pruitt Ron Fellows is up to third we look a little further back the car driven by Boris said in the field as we take a look back at the field from one to two and downhill to turn three all right Tommy Kendall is so impressive right now you can see he is stretching a lead already with this Roush car this is totally built by Jack Roush, the name we've become so familiar with in NASCAR. He did the chassis, did the motors. It is all his car and is incredibly effective. You can see two back. Scott Pruitt is really having problems already with those two blue Mustangs right on his tail. So his hands are full and admittedly his qualifying laps were done with almost closed eyes. He said it took all of his courage. Kendall Pruitt, Fellows, Dorsey Schrader, and Jack Baldwin, your top five. Only two Chevrolets in that top five and in the qualifying order, only two Chevrolets in the top eight today. So Ford certainly looking to dominate as we see the Archer Brothers cars and Boris said the Rainex sponsorship on Greg Pickett's car and it's great to have Greg back in the series he did not start at Miami although his team was there supplying cars for RJ Valentine Greg Pickett one of the great competitors in the Trans Am Tour this is the race for second third and fourth Dorsey Schrader at car number 12 settling back into fourth spot fellows on his home track he's given Scott Pruitt a mirror fall yes he can't help but be pumped up to be to be racing in front of your home crowd it really does something for you whether it's a, a basketball game or whatever, but particularly with a race. He is all these Canadian fans. There's a nice shot of Tom Candle up in the corner there, and I bet he's smiling right now. He's got a bit of a lead, but look at how he's driving the car, and I think this says a lot. Very, very smooth, and as the race goes on, all of the drivers had expressed some concern over tire wear today. The smoother you drive the most poor track, the longer your tires are going to stay in their optimal conditions. We weren't expecting this, but all the drivers in the field have selected hard compound 600 compound tires today. Yeah, I was amazed. I did not think I would ever see the day that that would happen, particularly at Mosport. And it, 
it has become sort of a, a challenge for them because with a harder compound, you slide a tire more. It's going to wear better, but up to a certain point. Because you're sliding more, the temperatures build up, and then you wear that even harder than you would with soft. Everyone's staying nice and straight. Here's a battle ah. for third taking shape. The Tommy Kendall car moving away as we look back a little further in the field there. The two Gloy cars, the two blue Mustangs, side by side for third spot. Fellows is third. Dorsey trying him on the outside for fourth. Yeah, and look at the Hot Wheels Camaro. They made a huge air block going up the straight, and Jack Baldwin had to be smiling at this one developing. It's, it's interesting that Tom Gloy will allow his two teammates to battle each other, and to show how close they were, they were only one one hundredth of a second apart in qualifying, so they're very well-matched drivers and cars. No number one and number two car on that team. It's every man for himself, to be sure. Kendall, with about a four car length advantage, the top 12 are nose to tail down the short straight between turn two and turn three. Dorsey Schrader looking for a way to get around Ron Fellows as the two blue cars there battle for third. The two Mustangs, Fellows, looking inside of Pruitt just a little. Yeah, Pruitt is playing a little bit of a blocking game right now. He is working that car so hard. I've seen a couple of times already where the car is wiggling under braking, showing that he is right on the limit of adhesion. Watch them go down the hill here. This is 135 mile an hour stuff, and then right there, heavy, heavy braking. Now that, that time he was stable, he was okay, there wasn't a problem, but he is really going to be pushing hard. Now Pruitt is an Indy driver this year as well. He is doing a lot of testing for an Indy team, so when he finishes here, for example, he jumps on a plane, heads out, and right into an Indy car. This is the best thing possible for a racing driver to get all of this exposure to daily racing. Scott Pruitt, certainly one of the great drivers in the series, past champion here, his 36th career Trans Am start in the Buzz McCall 01, the Royal Oak sponsorship on that car. That's the car that Scott Sharp took to the series championship last year. Sharp now advancing to Indy cars, trying to qualify, in fact, for the Indy 500 this weekend. Field back onto the main straightaway, very short main straight here at Mostport. Kendall has led all the way, but Pruitt has been close to him several times already. He has, and I'm very, very surprised right now. I really had expected Tom Kendall to pull out a three or four second cushion and try and stabilize there so that he wasn't pushing the car. Right now, he has no time. Look at this. This is an incredible train of cars right here, and nobody is breaking away from the pack. They're all the top ten cars. Very, very competitive. Dorsey Schrader in fourth spot tried to get by. Fellows has settled down. Fellows takes a peek inside Pruitt off of that corner, but he's unable to make the move, so Scott Pruitt comfortably in second spot over Ron Fellows. Dorsey Schrader sits in fourth. Jack Baldwin is fifth. We're six laps into the High and Zells Trans Am here at Most Fort Park. Round two of the 94 Trans Am Championship on Prime. We'll be right back. Rick Benjamin, Bill Adam, and Chris McClure with you on a gorgeous Sunday afternoon for racing. Tom Kendall in the all-sport Ford Mustang leading the show very early on, but Scott Pruitt, Ron Fellows, Dorsey Schrader, Jack Baldwin, the Archer brothers, nobody giving any quarter here in the early going. Kendall really doing a fantastic job. One of the things everyone's very concerned about today is tires. Chris McClure has more on that. Historically, the tires have not been much of an issue on this racetrack in that they weren't abused enough for people to worry about what compound they had. Unusual in that every car in this field chose hard tires for all four corners. 600s, the hard compound that Goodyear offers. And it's never happened before in the history of the series since they began making those selections, but we heard at the top of the show Scott Pruitt and a couple of the others making remarks about it's warmer today than we thought it would be. Tires could become an issue here for the first time in a long time. We, we ought to keep an eye on that. And, and Bill Adam, what do you think about everybody going on hard tires all the way around? I am really surprised. I had expected somebody to take a gamble on it to just, just run a softer compound because you're going to get into a situation of having a superior car at least for a few laps. Sometimes when you can pull away and get a bit of a gap, you demoralize the competition, but apparently everybody is so worried about the heat, they have decided to play a safe waiting game. As we watch Jack Baldwin in the Hot Wheels Camaro first pass, really among the front runners, Baldwin has moved up to fourth spot. He was able to sneak by Ron Fellows and start to give chase to some of the leaders as we take a look at the lead cars moving by. Right now, Baldwin showing in the number four position out of the 92 Trans Am champion. That's the other Buzz McCall car, the other AER racing automobile. Dorsey Schrader sitting in the third spot. Baldwin now fourth and 
Fellows back to fifth, and there's a little gap starting develop to develop there, Bill. The top three starting to pull away a little bit. Yeah, perhaps that is why Jack just decided to make the pass right there, that maybe he felt he had to up the ante. Right now, they're running lap times of a few seconds off their qualifying pace, so I think it's a, it's a case of settling down, trying to get into a nice groove, but how fast do you go? How slow do you go? This, this is all a, it's a poker game right now. Bobby Archer in car number nine, moving up now. He is in sixth position, right behind Fellows, and it looks as though Fellows may oh, start to trouble. lose something. He's got a problem, no doubt about it, and the Archer brothers will go by, so a tough break for Ron Fellows, former winner here at his home track, and he is apparently out of the action. We see his car very slowly out of turn seven, out of the Moss Corner as the leaders move up the Andretti straightaway. You are right. Unfortunately, Archer was in the wrong place, the wrong turn, and any other corner, he could have swung wide. At Moss Corner, it is so narrow getting out of that hairpin, he just simply was blocked. I think he may even have contact the back of that car, so we'll have to keep an eye and watch the front of the car to see if there's any damage on that Archer Mustang. Looked like Fellows had perhaps lost something in the motor earlier because he did slow down markedly, and then obviously something broke as he came out of that turn. Now the top four starting to settle down and pull away. Kendall Steele, your leader, Jack Baldwin, now up to fourth. There's the Archer Automobiles in fifth and sixth position now. Being shown in seventh spot is car number three at this point in the event. That's the Tommy Archer Automobile as the top four move it through uh, turns two, three, and four and head toward the straightaway. The tire choice, you had told me before we went on, Bill, as we're going to take a look here at what happened to Fellows, you had said if you were running today, you would have picked a softer tire. We'll talk about that in a moment. Here's the car of Fellows backing up the field, coming out of the corner, everybody having to jump oh, on the brakes. Just, just the old accordion and traffic, and look at how everybody bunched up there, but thankfully they all got through safely. That is a mark of experience. The same thing happened there as what happened on the starting grid that took out Ray Kong. All of those drivers, very experienced. It was not not a problem at all, other than creating a little bit of a gap. Well, Bobby Archer and Tommy Archer running fifth and sixth, and they're starting to close it up now on the top four. So that means that competition is coming. Boris Said is back in seventh spot. That's the black Mustang with Eagle One livery on that car today. Boris Said out of the Gloy Racing shops as well. Tom Kendall, still your leader. We're working lap number nine here at Mostport Park out of 40, 100 miles. And for those of you who may not be as familiar with the Trans Am Series, these are sprint races, only 100 to 125 miles. Pruitt taking a look there on Kendall. The strategy here is don't pit. If you have to pit, you're in big trouble. Definitely. You, you are out of it without question. I think you're going to see the pace pick up because it, Pruitt definitely did take a, a little bit of a look up the inside to Kendall to just make him open up his mirrors. Here's a shot of somebody in the pits, and I'm not sure. I wonder if this is Bill Saunders. They've been working on Saunders. No, no, it's a white car we see on the pit road. It could be Dale Phelan's car. There's the number 49. Yes. Number we can look at it. It's Clint Welding, Clint Welding out of Oneonta, New York. The Welding Racing Crew looking under the hood of that automobile. We'll try to send Chris McClure over there to tell us a little more about what's going on. I was watching the scoring and timing monitor here just a few moments ago, Bill, as we watched the crew look under the hood of Welding's machine. The car of Kendall, who's out in front, the car number 11. Kendall lapping about four-tenths slower the last time by, and there's a pass for the lead. Scott Pruitt has gotten by, and Kendall with a problem, evidently, slowing down quite a bit. And Scott Pruitt is your new leader. We noticed the times of the last lap that Kendall had slowed down markedly. Scott Pruitt has taken the car of Dorsey Schrader and the car of Jack Baldwin right by Tom Kendall. So we have a new leader at the High Zells Trans Am Round 2 of the 94 Championships here at Most Sport Park. Your leader is Pruitt. We'll be right back with more racing in a moment. Back at Most Ford Park, round two of the 94 SCCA Trans Am Championship and a new leader, Scott Pruitt, who has won here in the past, has taken the Royal Oak Camaro out in front. Dorsey Schrader has moved up to second. Jack Baldwin is third. Whatever happened to Tommy Kendall's automobile, maybe we could send Chris McClure down to the Roush Racing Pits. Kendall is back on speed at this point. Chris McClure is on pit road. Chris, what do you have? Well, the last pass up the front straightaway, he talked to Max Jones of the Roush Racing Team pit side, and he said, I'm fine now. Didn't say what happened, but Jones thinks he just bobbled a bit. He's back up to speed. Now he's got to get some positions back. In the... Uh Fellows uh, case, it's an ignition problem. They're trying some switches on board, giving him, him instructions, working very hard, trying to find a, a proper circuit. Right now, they can't. Are these cars built like NASCAR cars that have backup ignition boxes that you can throw a switch and bring another system on? Yeah, they do. They, they can be changed pretty quickly, but unfortunately, these are not NASCAR races 500 miles long, so he is out of 
you don't get any fierier a driver than Mr. Gentlosi. He gets his teeth into it, and yet he has been very patient throughout this first part of the race. He is a well-fixed real estate developer in Michigan, does very well at his private business, and racing really is another major business. He's the owner of Rocket Sports. They built their own chassis, and he is back in the Trans Am Series this year, started toward the end of last year. As we watch a move by Boris Sed on the back straightaway, Sed trying to move up and take fourth away from Tommy Archer as the leaders move up the Andretti straightaway. Here's your leader, Scott Pruitt. Baldwin is second. Bobby Archer, Tommy Archer, the two brothers and teammates, said back in fifth in the black car. Those are three Mustangs trailing the two Chevrolets. Baldwin running in second spot, lapping by the car of Clint Welding. We showed you Welding on pit road earlier. He started shotgun on the field, and the leader's now moving by to put him a lap down as we work. Lap number 17 here this afternoon. The two Buzz McCall teammates out in front. Baldwin at most port, a seventh, a sixth, a second, and third the last couple of years. We take you back all the way to 1990. He is a one Wonderful racing driver. No matter what Jack Baldwin gets in, his foot is on the floor. And we watch him quite frequently in the IROC series sure. driving cars that he is not familiar with, not like the Camaro here. And he's a whale of a good driver, so he enjoys this sport. He started to dab a foot in the NASCAR waters a little yes. bit in the last year or two, running a couple of Bush Grand National races. Tells me he hopes to do 7 to 10 next year. Uh, he is a great competitor in IROC representing the Trans Am Tour. First most sport Trans Am a long time ago, almost 30 years ago, back to 20 years ago, back that 76. Ludwig Heimrath, there's a name you know. I do. Took the checkered flag. Yes, it, Ludwig is a, is a real fixture of Canadian racing. One of these men that he, he's kind of like A.J. Foyt. Nothing makes him happy, but boy, he's great. <laughs> Another There's battle for fourth spot there as we watch Boris said to the outside. I think he's going to get by Tommy Archer. No, oh. Archer's able to hold him off. Again, this is high-speed stuff. They're cresting that hill at 165 miles per hour, 166. And then it's bravery. Who can wait the longest before you get on the brakes? Well, for the Archer, he's in the right spot. He's in the inside of the track. And Boris, unfortunately, is going to be faced with a tire wall. Boris seems to be getting off turn five, the Moss Corner, a little better. That's the second lap in a row. We've seen him get a good jump off that turn, a good, a good run down the straightaway, but the Archer's able to block him there as we take you back through the front five or six again. Here's Tommy Archer moving by in car number three. Joe Kantarek, his crew chief. They've had quite an interesting couple of years since they've committed to the Trans Am. They wear in Dodges the first few years. They lost their Dodge deal. They're with their third really different car configuration in the last two years. Yes, and it, it's got to be a bit rewarding for them right now. They had spent the money to come up here and test early, and in fact, had tested equal times of the pole speed for this race today. During the pole or qualifying sessions, they had not been able to rematch those times, so they were kind of frustrated. But now, they made some changes on their car at the last minute, and they have to be very, very pleased at what's taking place in the early stages. Once again, Boris said, though, close right up coming out of the hairpin it looked like yes yeah, see the archer car got a little bit loose on the corner and look at how the the, the said car the black car in the right of your picture is coming up alongside he will make the pass this lap he's going to pull over in front of him yes made it right there pass for fourth spot boris said out of stanford connecticut making the move around tommy archer and moving into fourth spot bobby archer dead ahead said in one of the glory racing mustangs with the eagle one sponsorship today on the side of the car and he has now split the archer brothers up and that may have a little to do with strategy the archers riding together and uh, they are making uh, their best effort right now to run in third and fifth spot tommy kendall back in sixth the archer brothers doing great jobs here today and their two mustangs chris mcclure on pit road with another member of the archer brothers team third brother is mike archer he talks to bobby most specifically it was 3-4 a moment ago, now 3-5, but a good day for the team altogether. We expected a Chevrolet Ford shootout, but not necessarily your two guys right there together. Well, I think I think we can run uh, right there with everybody. Uh, we, we've proven that in the past. The uh, Shell Zone Highway Master uh, Ford Mustangs, which are new to us this year, are yeah. running pretty good. I, I think we'll be okay. Uh, right now we're running Bobby's car uh, with the Archer Racing Accessories on it, hoping to look, hoping to find a bigger, better sponsor for Bobby so we can run, uh, hopefully, right at the front. Tommy Archer and Bobby Archer and their brother Mike in the pits for him today, helping mastermind this effort at the moment. They're third and fifth, but here's Boris said, looking on Bobby Archer, the Archer Brothers racing car. Boris trying to make a move and move up to third. Boris said, one of those young drivers, he's still in his early 20s, who really a lot is expected of, I think, Bill. It, it is, and I think Boris showed how serious he is. Boris is one of the, how should I put it, the more flamboyant members yes. of the Trans Am Circus. And Boris even cut his hair into a very reasonable length <laughs> to make himself 
themselves more presentable, more fashionable. Really, things that are required when you get this level of excellence and prestige in racing. Bobby Bobby Archer's Bobby. car number I nine, also crew chief by Joe Cantera. Good Bobby sitting in third spot right now. He's pretty much been riding there the last many laps as we look at the top two, the two Buzz McCall cars of Scott Pruitt and Jack Baldwin and Tommy Archer running along in the fifth spot. Bobby up to third now. And as again, they move by some of the slower traffic here today. A little smoke from one of the cars. 66 is the Dale Phelan automobile who started at the back of the pack. As we watch uh, the Archer car move by the car number nine driven by Bobby out of Duluth, Minnesota. Leaders two Chevrolets out in front now, and a lot of folks thought this would be another Ford benefit, but Buzz McCall's team said not if we have anything to do about it. We're just past halfway in the High Zell's Trans Am on Prime from Most Ford Park, and we'll be back in a moment. Terrific competition here at Most Ford Park, and Paul Genlozzi seems to be a driver on the move. We can take a look at the black and white Rocket Sports Camaro, the 28. He has moved up to sixth, kicking Tommy Kendall back to seventh spot. And Bill, we're in the second half of the race now. I have to believe that if Tommy Kendall has anything to show today, he's going to have to start showing it soon. There's quite a gap developing, and Jen Losey is really coming up on the leaders here. Yeah, uh, maybe I'm starting to believe that he indeed does have a problem because I'm kind of surprised that he is letting the field pull away a little bit. You just don't want to get too far back. One of the problems in following this many cars is that if you're only following one car, you've only got to worry about that car making a mistake and you getting collected by his mistake. But now, any one of five mistakes could take Kendall out of the picture. So he is presenting himself to much more danger by following that group. You can see Paul Genelosi indeed making some great moves in the last several laps, and he is dog tracking the Archer Brothers cars at the moment. The Archers running fourth and fifth. Genelosi started back in tenth, has come up to sixth. He's made some of the best moves of the race. Kendall back in seventh. George Robinson, we want to give him a call, the driver out of Texas in the white number 74 yes. car on the 74 Hunting Ranch cars. We watch Genelosi out of Lansing, Michigan, up to sixth spot, then Kendall back behind him in seventh in the green and black automobile. Genelosi in the cars of his own design. Most of these cars are Riley and Scott chassis cars. There are some weavers. Jen Losey and Roush deciding they're going to build their own cars, go their own way, and I guess there's a lot of risk attached to that as we watch Kendall move closer to Jen Losey to challenge for six. Well, interesting, too, that the man that he chose to do all the work on developing his own chassis was Lee White, one of the people who was responsible for Roush's dominance through the Trans Am years. He got Lee into leaving, originally went to Oldsmobile, now they're doing the Chevrolet cars, and just he's a brilliant designer. Lee White also is very familiar with this track. He used to race his own cars up here a long time ago, so Lee White knows Mosport as well as anybody. The Archers continuing to move by. Jen Losey right behind him in sixth spot. We're going to take a look now at the Ford mid-race summary today here at Mosport Park. Jen Losey there in sixth, the Archers in fourth and fifth. We are 24 laps complete for your leader, who continues to be Scott Pruitt. The Ford's doing very, very well today, running in third spot, fourth spot, and fifth spot as we watch the leaders work by. There's more said in car number 22, running in third. The Archer Brothers, Ford mounted. Bobby and Tommy, fourth and fifth. Tommy Kendall is seventh. So you've got Fords in the third, fourth, and fifth positions, and also seventh in the field right now as we watch the leaders work around. Here today. Scott Pruitt, your leader, out onto the main straightaway. We're coming up on about 15 laps to go, Bill. And uh, Tom Kendall, a driver of whom much was expected, he led all the way at Miami, qualified on the pole here. His crew saying there's nothing wrong with the car, but Kendall letting a lot of racetrack get between him and the lead at this point. Yeah, I mean, uh, you watch Tom limp over to the car and you think that maybe he has had a date with Tanya Harding, but <laughs> that's not something that slows him down at all. He has no residual effects from that horrible crash he had a few years ago. He's in excellent physical shape, and I have to believe the car just isn't working right in one area, or perhaps it's a case of overheating. But all through practice and qualifying, this car has performed flawlessly. Some of the teams have had little problems here and there, and they've been changing balance of the cars or changing different parts. The Roush team have just had a trouble-free time up here, and a lot of that is due to the amount of testing they do. One of the other teams that has anything but a trouble-free day going today, the Tom Bloy Racing Mustangs of Dorsey Schrader and Rod Fellows. Chris McClure is standing by with Tom Bloy. Well, there's another guy in the stable, the youngster, Boris Said, who's doing quite nicely. Tom Bloy, you and I over coffee this morning discussed this young man. You really like him. I really do. A lot of talent. He's aggressive. He's, he's wanted to be a race car driver his whole life, and uh, he's done anything and everything. 
everything that it takes to get to where he's at today. He, he deserves everything he's doing. He's going to win this thing, maybe. So is he talking much, Tom? Is he talking to you much? I couldn't hear you. He, does he talk to you much while he's running? Not much. No, he's concentrating pretty hard. A couple of Chevys ahead of him. He'd like to put that uh, the Eagle One car ahead of those guys. Okay, fellas, in this case, I suspect silence is golden. He's probably feeling pretty good. A lot of drivers don't like to talk much if things are going well, and evidently that's the case for Boris Said in car number 22, that black Mustang up to third. Take a look at the top five. Coming up on 15 to go, Pruitt, the 87 Trans Am champion, back in the series full-time this year. He and Baldwin, the two Buzz McCall racing teammates, setting the pace. Boris Said, Bobby Archer, Tommy Archer, your top five here at Most Board Park. Right behind them in sixth spot is Jen Losey. And oh. drivers said, we've got trouble. Contact. Jen Losey may have been involved in that. No, one of the Archer cars is involved the three car oh. Tommy Archer and Archer up over the berm to try to get pointed in the right direction most board I would think is a place you don't want to sit in the middle of the racetrack very no long. and he did not want to go over that berm I'll guarantee that he did a lot of damage under the nose of the car and they have a very expensive air box that, in fact we heard early is worth five thousand dollars it is not going to be in very good shape after going over that curb it's probably a 12 inch rise right there that in turn five uh, the Moss corner. We take a look once again. The Archer car spinning. Jed Losey got by him. The car of Tommy Kendall going by. We see Greg Pickett and George Robinson. No contact. Evidently yeah. didn't even look like Tommy had any help getting around there. No. It, it, another show of class, I think, by seasoned professionals. Here's a car spinning in front of you as you're entering a corner just after a 130 mile hour blast. And they were all able to get by. So only incidental contact that may have caused the spin, but everybody else was safely passed. As we take a look a little further back in the field, one car off the pace, some of the cars moving by. As we take a look, they shuffle down through turns uh, 7, 8, and 9, and up to the back side. The 67 car, that's Jamie Gallus. Kendall, Greg Pickett moving by, and George Robinson, those cars running 6, 7, 8, and 9. Here at the High and Zells Trans Am. Your leader continues to be Scott Pruitt as they go under the Flares billboard. There's Jen Losey and Kendall battling for sixth. We'll be back with more in a moment. Most Ford Park. We're in the second half of today's High Zells Trans Am and the car of R.J. Valentine, the car that's off the pace. Bill, you call that R.J. Uh, oftentimes runs into a little bit of problem at this stage of the race. He's off the pace here today with about 15 to go. The leaders moving by. We saw a car out of line the last time around right before that last break. Boris said in third. Tommy Archer in fourth. There's your top four cars down the short straightaway between turns two and three. You had told me earlier that going into three is a favorite place to pass here at Most we haven't seen much of that so no i've been very surprised because you carry so much speed out of that corner right there look at candle trying to sneak up the inside in fact watch tommy's car right here and see how little track he uses compared to baldwin as we watch boris said actually give chase to jack baldwin there the leaders moving up on some slower cars the bob patch car the number 20 the archers coming up now here's kendall moving into the picture trying to work up closer and get by the slower car of valentine he's got greg pickett behind him now oh. kendall being shown at the moment in sixth behind jen Losey. the leaders moving by slow Lower traffic, a good opportunity perhaps here for Jack Baldwin or Boris Said. Here's Said. Yeah, and I, I thought actually that one of the uh, the Archer cars is going to be able to take advantage of that just for a brief moment, but no, Boris is able to get back on the gas and stretch out that lead once again. The red car on the outside with the yellow back bodywork, that's Donald Sack out of Michigan, one of the two Oldsmobiles in the field, and he's one of the slower cars. Leaders working by Bob Patch's automobile, too. Another car off the pace. Your top three, Scott Pruitt in the yellow and orange Royal Oak car with 13 to go. Behind him is Jack Baldwin sitting third, the black Mustang out of the Galois stables. That is Boris said. There are your top three up onto the main straightaway. Then we have some lapped cars in the mix at that point. Bob Patch moving out of line just a little bit. Down into turn one. Patch on the inside. He's blocking uh, Tommy, uh, Bobby Archer actually at that point in car number nine. Bobby running in fourth position. Fifth is Paul Gentilosi right now. We'll go back and show you Gentilosi here in just a moment. That's been a dandy battle. Gentilosi had advanced to sixth. Now he's up to fifth. Some of the other cars have had problems. Tommy Kendall oh, trying to move that. in. Car off the course. Bob Patch, who was off the pace, the only Pontiac in the field, and he's into the tire barrier and stops safely. Uh, hard contact, though, for Bob Patch. That is exactly what the tires are designed to do. Because you're cresting this hill in excess of 130 miles per hour, once you get on the grass, it's just like the old saying, the car feels like it speeds up. They use the tires to absorb an impact rather than have the car come hard up against the concrete. So look at this, he's able to continue. Bob Patrick Laverne, California, getting his Matco tools. Pontiac refired. We look at this once again in turn four. Just off the outside edge of the track, Bob got too far off trying to give some of these guys some room to get past. Patch on 
the brakes as we watch him slowly back into the tire barrier. Didn't hit it too hard. He was able to keep the car fired up and get going. Oops. Well, maybe not. He stopped quickly off the course. Yeah, this, this is just a little further out of the course. I wonder if he did damage the car or perhaps he spun with his own enthusiasm in getting back on the track. Patch, in any case, has stopped the Matco Tools Pontiac Trans Am and it uh, looks as though his afternoon will be over. We're coming up 10 to go here very shortly. And again, as we've mentioned, with the tire concerns, it is warm, 84 degrees at green flag time this afternoon at Mosport. If any drivers have anything left, we're 12 laps left at this point for Scott Pruitt. Now's the time to show it. And again, we have to think that Tommy Kendall has run into some sort of difficulty. Perhaps his motor has just lost a little bit of its edge. Yeah, uh, I'm sure it has. If there's something that has to have gone astray in that car, but there's certainly an ample time to, to play a waiting game when, when a race is 40 laps long. But at this point, because they have put such a gap between third place and fourth place cars, now it's doubly hard for Kendall to try and catch up. So I don't think it will happen. As you see, the success that Buzz McCall's American Equipment Racing Team has had in the Trans Am Tour the last three seasons. Three-time champions, Scott oh. Jarvis, Jack Baldwin, have shared oh. that bit. Now we watch Tommy Kendall coming off the fourth and fifth corners here, getting in front of Greg Pickett sliding a little bit. Maybe his tires have gone. Yeah, it, it, uh, I made two errors there. I said between the third and fourth car. It should have been between the fourth and fifth. But as soon as I said that, all of a sudden, Campbell has put on a spurt, and he is, in fact, closing the gap. Look, there goes fourth just out of the picture. Campbell is at fifth, and he's closing back up again. So this is not over yet for Tom Campbell. Kendall, with coming up on 10 to go, about uh, 30 miles left in the chase here today, needs to get it back in gear. He qualified on the pole much quicker than everyone else. Now he's got some open racetrack in front of him with the leaders just ahead. Kendall is being shown in fifth. He's advanced now. He's gotten by Gentle Ozzy. We're going to show you the leaderboard here in just a moment. As Kendall works back into it, Scott Pruitt over Jack Baldwin and Boris said there's a little shuffling going on back there. Tommy Kendall, we believe, has moved to fifth spot now around Jenna Losey. Coming up on 10 to go here at the High and Zells Trans Am at Most Port Park. Glad you could be with us today on Prime. Round two of the 1994 SCCA Trans Am Championship being brought to you by the new Dodge Division of the Chrysler Corporation featuring the Caravan, the Intrepid, the Ram Pickup, and the Dodge Neon. We'll be back at Most Port to take in on the checkered flag in just a moment. here at Most Board Park. Coming up 10 to go. Great to have you with us today for the SCCA Trans Am Tour on Prime. Rick Benjamin, Bill Adam, Chris McClure with you on a picture-perfect weather day. We see the top three up onto the main straightaway. Pruitt, your leader in the 01. Baldwin second in car number one. Morris said third in the 22, and he's starting to give Baldwin fits. Tommy Archer off the track earlier. Bobby Archer is fourth. Tommy Kendall now up to fifth. Jed Losey has fallen off the pace. He's back in seventh spot and a good bit of distance back to him. George Robinson in the 74 car there running eight. And Jan Losey's going to have a problem too. His spoiler is folding oh, under yeah. the right front corner. That is going to seriously upset the aerodynamics. So he will have a bit of a problem. But Tom Candle definitely is on the charge in that Roush car. He is closing up very quickly. How often, you what it brings to mind, Scott Sharp. Yeah, how many times did we watch him fall back to fifth, sixth place, buy this time, come through, win the race, and of course he eventually sure. won the championship. Through. Uh, As we watch Jan Losey again with that damaged right front corner on the car. And here where aerodynamics are so important, that's causing him some fits. Ron Fellows back in the chase. We saw him briefly. Now there's Kendall moving by as we look at the leaders. This is the Andretti straightaway. And we watch Pruitt, Baldwin, and Sed. And there is the Bobby Archer automobile. Tommy Kendall with a lapped car in front of him. The white car, lap car. Kendall in fifth now. He started on the pole, fell all the way back to seventh for a time. Less than 10 to go, and Kendall has the whip out. He does. He is flying around this track, and we have seen very little evidence of flying other than watching the cars get closer. So look at how smooth Tommy is. He is beautiful to watch, whereas some of the other cars, watch the Archer car accelerate out of the hairpin. You'll see a little bit of a tail slide like we've seen before, and they're moving around. The Kendall, the Roush car, is a very good chassis. He has saved his tires. He may have played the smartest waiting game of all as he is quickly closing. If his engine had soured for a moment, it's clearly come back on. A lot of drivers very concerned because they say the Roush team can get a lot more RPMs out of their Ford motors yes. than the other teams can. He ought to have plenty of power. Well, they do admit that. And, and in fact, Dorsey Schrader thought that perhaps they were trying to help Tom's injury in the making him shift fewer times. If you rev it higher, sometimes you don't have to shift from third to fourth and back to third. As we watch the battle for seventh, Gentle Ozzy in there, along with George Robinson and Jamie Gallus, who we need to give a call to. Yes. Uh, Jamie Gallus in his first Trans Am start in that 67 car, doing a great job to crack the top ten. Chris McClure is on pit road for us. Well, Moody is the 
team manager for Buzz McCall's team, and they have positions one and two. You've been watching them very closely in terms of lap times, tire management, everything in order according to plan. We didn't plan on, on leading the race. I think Tommy's laying back, saving his tires, making a good show of it. I think he's got a lot left. With that in mind, does your tires have enough left? You guys have been running a little quicker on a lap-by-lap -lap basis. to show their poker hand at this stage of the game, but we do have seven to go, which means only about 17 or 18 miles of racing left, Bill Adam. And at this point, you've got to think that anybody who's got anything left at all, Pruitt now about six car lengths ahead, you have to think they've got to be charging as hard as they can. Well, it's getting pretty close to it. I think that Campbell is closing up to a point now where he is going to start occupying the mirror of the fourth place car. It's very nice to be able to drive a race when all you've got to worry about is the car immediately ahead of you. You concentrate on your line, what he's doing his mistakes but now that fourth place car suddenly sees this big black and green mustang looming in his mirror we took a look there at the tommy archer car this is the battle for seventh eighth ninth and tenth genelosi at the moment in seventh of the 28 cars they left by slower cars back in tenth spot as tommy archer went off the course and we need to give a call to the archer brothers crew tommy got back on course i suspect he didn't even make a pit stop he hasn't lost any track position to speak of he was up in the lead group now he's in the second draft of cars and tommy archer doing a great job uh, recovering from that spin nicely getting the car back pointed in the right direction and underway and he's looking at the top 10 finisher today ron fellows same thing car number four he's in 11th spot also being shown on the lead lap as again we watch paul gentilosi damaged body work and all gentilosi's fallen a little bit off the pace to seventh but he's doing a great job holding off a bunch of very strong cars right behind him back up in front meantime scott pruitt still being shown out in front as there's a pass being made on Gentilosi. Gentilosi just lost seventh spot there. Here are your leaders. Pruitt over Jack Baldwin. Morris said is third. Tom Bobby Archer is fourth. Tommy Kendall fifth. We've got six laps to go here at Mosborg Park. And we'll be back to take you to the finish in a moment. Leaders on the back part of the race course at Mosborg Park. They work through the Moss corner, getting ready to move onto the main straightaway. Scott Pruitt out in front. Just a handful of laps to go, and it's great to have you with us today on Prime. There's Pruitt in the orange car. Baldwin is second in the blue number one. Boris said in the black car, and here comes Tommy Kendall, as you call it. Again, out of the hairpin. Tommy got a great run. Now we're going to see a case of bravery over the hill. Here we go, 165 miles an hour. Who waits the longest? Look at this, side oh. by side around eight. Position. Now we've got a left-hand turn up ahead. Watch this and see if we can do it. He and Bobby Archer door to door oh. for fourth spot, and Kendall doesn't get by him. Bobby Archer says, no, you're not going to take it from me that easily up onto the main straightaway. Great action. Now he's got to rethink, but he wants to get by as fast as he can. Here he goes, down into one. Kendall he's got on the, the inside, making the move to fourth spot, getting by the Archer automobile. So Tommy Kendall picks off one, but look at the gap up to third. Unfortunately, by trying to pass through eight, nine, and ten, side by side neither car could really get a lot of speed through that it cost them both a ton of time but watch Kendall here he's going to show does he have it what it takes is he going to be able to pull away from Archer if he can pull away we're going to know that he's still got a lot of car left under him he's already opened up two or three car lengths on Bobby Archer he is fourth now Tommy Kendall your pole qualifier here today sat on the pole in the first race at Miami and led flag to flag today he's elected to drop back and now try to put on a late race charge as we have left Less than five to go. There's your leader, Pruitt, with lap traffic ahead. Now, this will certainly play to the advantage of Tommy Kendall and the other cars. Jack Baldwin second in the blue car, said third in the black car. Here's Kendall in the black and green car, the all-sport Mustang. It's going to play a huge problem because it, it depends on where they get the traffic. If you get it in the wrong place, it can really hurt you. If you're lucky enough to get up on the exit of a corner where you can run full throttle without having to lift out of it, it really doesn't make too much of a difference. So luck is all that counts here. Bobby Archer back in fifth now in car number nine being shown in the sixth position Greg Pickett in car number six is Cytomax Rainex car Pickett one of my favorite drivers in this series he's been at it for going on 20 plus years now yeah. almost since the inception of Trans Am and he's really done a great job here today his first start of the season did not make the haul to Miami but he's here doing well Baldwin lapping by Randy Rubin's car here's Kendall once again four laps to go actually less than four last time by start finish as the leaders work the backside of the course here's Pruitt moving by a lapped automobile Baldwin is second there's your third 
car, Morris said. And now Baldwin will have to contend with the number 30 car. That's the Canadian driver, Brian Richards, making his only fourth, I believe, Trans Am uh, Series start. And Jack Baldwin just got him at the wrong spot, going into turn four, where you have to be so careful. Look at that. Took him the entire length of the corner. Morris closed right up on his tail. And Kendall now is on the tail of both of them. Kendall may get a shot going up the straight this time, Rick. They move out of the Moss corner, the very tight hairpin, and up onto the back straightaway as they get up through the gears. We'll see who gets the best jump here. I think Kendall could have a good run up the straight. Morris got really sideways on the exit of the corner, but now the horsepower of Morris's car is showing up here, too. That's pretty impressive. Here, top four cars. Pruitt has started to check out a little bit as these cars have developed a battle into second, third, and fourth. Morris said, now living in Carlsbad, California, 22 running in third spot right ahead of him Baldwin is second Kendall fourth there's Bobby Archer in fifth Greg Pickett six now in car six back up on the main straightaway they're gonna put lap 37 on the board three to go this time by and this great battle for second spot right here God is this the Jack best? Baldwin trying to hold off a couple of young chargers as Pruitt now takes advantage and if you're in that spot as Pruitt is don't you think this is your opportunity to stretch it out this is where you stretch as much as you can you run it right to the max of revs and if you were short shifting before. If the crew chief told you you could use 8,800, you use 88 or maybe even 89 now. Everybody throwing out whatever they've got out of the card table because we're getting down to it. Tim McAdams, 94 car out of the Rocket Sports Stables, a lapped car in the way, sort of, although Tim is a veteran driver, a very good driver. He won't block anyone purposely, but his car is there, and that's a factor. Yeah, Boris said very, very impressive. Scott Pruitt still leading right there, the Royal Oak car up the back straight. Doesn't have too many more to go. McAdam is going to operate as sort of a moving chicane to hold back the rest of the traffic. Baldwin now in second spot having to contend with McAdam. Said and Kendall right behind him in third and fourth, the fifth and sixth place cars. The Archer automobile, Bobby Archer there. And right behind him in sixth, Greg Pickett, who's really turned in a good, good ride today. Greg Pickett started uh, back pretty deep in the show, ninth, and he has advanced to sixth today. Pruitt, your leader, coming up on two laps to go. Baldwin holding up Boris Said, Tom Kendall, and Bobby Archer rounding out the top five. We'll be back at most points for the conclusion in a moment. race summary, actually, the closing race summary here today. The Chevrolets have turned in some great, great efforts as we watch Tim McAdam in one of those Bowtie automobiles. Scott Pruitt and Jack Baldwin running one and two. They qualified in the top ten, but they were really the only Chevrolets to qualify very well here today. Pruitt on the outside pole. He has taken the lead, took the lead really about 11 or 12 laps into the show, and he has set the pace the rest of the way. So Scott Pruitt carrying the Chevrolet banner as we're going to see the white flag next time by less than two to go and Tommy Kendall I have a feeling does not have anything left to show here today whatever happened whether his tires got overcooked early on or maybe he just made the wrong call on gearing for him no definitely he does not have anything left he is using that car up as hard as he can and that was a frustrating moment for him down at the bottom of the straight he closed up right on the bumper of Boris said in fact was ready to pass Archer was able to close up also in fact Archer got totally solid sideways going out of 5B, the exit of the corner onto the back straight. It was just a huge motion, but it gave Boris a little bit of an advantage. There was so much confusion, he was able to stretch out a couple of car length lead, which is so important right now. Leaders on the backside of the course, that should have been the white flag lap. Scott Pruitt showing the way, Jack Baldwin is second, Boris said running in third. Fourth spot to Tom Kendall, running in fifth. Bobby Archer, we're in the final go-round here at Mostport Park. Again, there's an indication of how hard people are trying. Boris Sed's car dancing under braking, the back of the car just hopping, entering turn three. The entrance that corner, probably 120 miles an hour. Watch down to the hairpin again, see if the same thing happens. Here comes Kendall to the inside, doesn't have room to make the pass. He took a look, didn't have enough. Here he is. This is the exit here. So important to carry the speed onto the straight. And again, he gets blocked. Turn five, the Moss corner up onto the end. Ready straight away. Last time around, your leader is Pruitt in the orange. Zero one. Baldwin is second. Said is third. Here's Greg Pickett making a move. Pickett in the yellow car. The Rain-X Camaro trying to move around the Bobby Archer automobile as they move up the back straight. Oh, and someone's motor just let go. We see white smoke out of Jack, Jack Baldwin's Baldwin. car. Oh, no. Baldwin coughing the motor in the last lap, and we'll see if he oh, they're off oil. oil. All of the cars behind him are off in the oil. Baldwin's going to go out. Baldwin's going to lose it. The second place car contacts the concrete barrier. A wild finish. But look we at see this. the Archer car off the track. We believe Tommy Kendall off the track, too. Scott Pruitt is going to go unchallenged. Boris Sad, I think, is off. Everybody is off. There's trouble on the racetrack. Bobby Archer off the course in the oil. Frantically. 
Baldwin trying to get back on the track. Baldwin's car is up against the wall. He has spun in his own oil. Baldwin with troubles on the back stretch of the last lap. He was running second. The motor let go as they went up over the hill. Everyone going by. Unbelievable. Tommy Archer, you can see he Oh, and look at Boris said. Boris he collected said. Boris said into the barricade. They had one corner to go through. And Bobby Archer's going to limp home. That car barely able to be kept on a straight line. Archer gets over the start-finish line and stops dead with heavy body damage and frame you know, damage. I'm not sure that may be second place. I think so. That. Boris said was running third. We know Baldwin didn't get to the finish line. Baldwin blew and whacked the wall. We know Boris said who was third didn't make it. Tommy Kendall may have come out of this in second spot. We'll wait and see. Kendall, according to timing and scoring, being shown forth. But we know your winner is Scott Pruitt. We'll try to sort all this out for you in just a couple of moments and we'll be back to talk to the winner show you what happened here on this very wild last lap of the SCCA Trans Am Tour at Most Board Park won by Scott Pruitt. We'll be back. <laughs> We've won more races in the history of NASCAR. is we've won more races over the last 30 years than any other automotive company have a nice day don't even well you see jack baldwin getting in his teammate's car for the slow ride back to pit road and we know jack baldwin very well we've worked with him in the past and we know as jack waved to the fans he has got to be one unhappy camper at this point had a great ride going the second place finish pretty much in the bag but the motor coughed on him and let go on the last go-round. Scott Pruitt wins it. Here's Baldwin's troubles. Now, look out the pipes. His motor has already gone. And at this point, the engine is self-destructing. Sooner or later, a piece is going to poke through the oil pan. And all of a sudden, he is now driving on his own oil. Wow. Just totally slippery. You can see, watch him enter the corner. The oil is going onto his back tires. He can't possibly hold the slide. He's looping in this oil. The car is going to go around. He's trying to correct it. Look at the front wheels turning. Yeah. And he's going, why now? There's 300 feet to go for the finish line. Why now? This is turn eight and over the tunnel to turn nine. And we see the track oiled down at this point. Remember, Baldwin was second. We saw Pruitt scooting away to the checkered flag. This is the last lap again. And watch the cars at the bottom of the screen. There's Boris Said across the grass. There's Tommy Kendall. Kendall. So he, didn't, he didn't make it either. Archer Hard and Said both into the tire barrier. Kendall trying to refire. We see the flames as he tries to get that car started and back in gear. Now, Bobby well, Archer's against the barrier. He did get restarted. We'll show you that in a moment. And Bobby Archer did limp across. They're showing in second spot at this point. Uh, the scoring shows Baldwin, but he didn't take the checkered flag. Baldwin's car against the barrier. Chris McClure on pit road with team owner Buzz McCall. Well, absolute acceleration. Turns a little bittersweet. Looked like one, two, and then Jack has the problem. But you still have four straight here. Well, it's a downside of a two-car team. I mean, sometimes they bring you a lot of joy. And sometimes real mixed feelings. But uh, it was good. Congratulations, Richard. Buzz McCall, they got a win. A victory for the AER Racing team, and Buzz McCall, a very happy driver to see, or happy team owner in this case, although a former driver, to see his driver, Scott Pruitt, take the checkered flag. But a wild conclusion. Baldwin's motor gave up about one mile from the oh, checkered flag. Boy, You yeah. figure these are 100-mile events, and you set things up to run 100 miles, and you don't get there. I can remember reading years ago the idea of a perfect racing car is to build it to go just far enough. Well, this car was about 300 feet short of being perfect. We need to check and see where Tom Kendall did end up. A lot of question marks there. Kendall didn't hit anything. He slid off the course. He got refired, we believe. There's the car, the number three car of Tommy Archer against the barrier. Yeah. He got into the oil and whacked it. That's the second trouble zone. He had a great run going oh, after boy. that earlier spin. He hit that thing hard, too, and you can see the medical on the seat taking care of him right away, so they want to make sure he's okay. But he had to hit it just so hard, and his body is being thrown sideways, giving himself like a whiplash. Now, these cars and drivers have their work cut out for them. It looks as though we've lost three or four very good cars here in the field. The race today is over, but two weeks from today, we go to Mid-Ohio. We'll be with you on Prime from the Mid-Ohio Sports Car Course for round three of the 1994 Trans Am Championship. And these guys, these crews, are going to have their work cut out for them getting they these will. cars straightened out. 
Our winner is in victory lane. A very happy Scott Pruitt. He's with Chris McClure. Well, this one makes career number 12. A nice even dozen on a nice sunny day. Oh, it's beautiful. The Camaro ran great. I got to say thanks to all the guys on the team. Royal Oak. They've done a super job all day long. Revo, Power Bar, everybody that's helped me along the way. We took a big gamble for the race in the setup, and it looks like it paid off. The car was real solid, real good all day long. And uh, this is four for four in Mossport, so I want to keep the record going. Recount, if you would, when you got the lead. Well, Tommy and I were back and forth, and uh, just going into four, got up the inside of him. Um, real clean, just went on by. And then I just kind of kept an eye from behind, because tires I knew were going to be a real, a real tough problem here. And we managed the tires good, managed the car good, ran solid all day long, and just thanks Chevrolet. Congratulations. Thank you. Scott Pruitt's got a win. Tommy Kendall just behind him. Ooh. As he congratulates Scott Pruitt, tell us about your race. You got way back there. They're a little late charge, not quite enough. Yeah, it wasn't. You know, I, I can't claim that I planned that last lap like that because that was as wild and wool as they come. But, you know, uh, Scott drove a really good race and I uh, think they've got a little bit of an arrow edge on us right now. We're just going to have to work hard, test a little bit and come back. And uh, the series is dynamite, though. Uh, you know, all sports first race is our team sponsor. they got to be happy with the second place. I was sucking on my drink bottle all day. That kept me nice and cool. And uh, I'm happy. Got the points lead. Now we're on to the next one. What happened early? You did drop well back. Uh, we talked to Max. He said you weren't complaining about the car. Maybe just a little bobble. No, it wasn't even that. That was a conscious decision to let those guys by, and uh, you know I thought tires were going to be more of an issue than they were. You know Goodyear builds a, a better tire than even I gave them credit for, and uh, you know they were rock solid even at the end. So next time we're just going to have to run a little harder earlier on and, and hold on to that point. Well, still not too bad for 94, a first and a second two poles. That's true. Thank you. Tommy Kendall, he comes second to Scott Pruitt. What a battle. Well, Kendall really got the second spot because of the Baldwin motor blowing up and other drivers going off the course, but Kendall able to take advantage of it there. We take a look at the top five, and what a change. Rookie driver Jamie Gallus in his first Trans Am start gets third behind Kendall and Pruitt. Ron Fellows, who had that problem earlier on, he comes back and finishes fourth. And Greg Pickett, who was doing a great job moving through the field, ends up fifth, his first start of the season in the Cytomax Rain-X Camaro. So, first five are on the board here at most ports. Scott Bruin, his first victory of the season. We'll be back. We are back at Most Ford Park. Second round of the 94 SCCA Trans Am Championship complete. Your winner, Scott Pruitt, he also picks up the $1,000 from Flowmaster Bufflers as the star of the race today. And Bill, you were saying Pruitt drove just a masterful race. He really did. He did not put a wheel wrong all day. He drove just fast enough that he wasn't challenged and yet not too fast that he suffered real serious tire problems at the end of the race. So perhaps all of the testing that he's been doing for a tire company has paid off. He, he has learned this sensitivity. And we really need to give a call. We mentioned his name a couple of times later in the broadcast. Jamie Gallus, the son of IndyCar owner Rick Gallus, the Ray Bestus Rising Star Award winner. Jamie gets credit for third spot today. He really took advantage of the situation with Jack Baldwin's motor letting go and several drivers running into trouble crashing in the last few feet, really, of this event today. But Jamie qualified well. He started from the 12th spot today in his entrepreneur magazine rain x camaro he advanced through the field he was well into the top 10 before that activity and he was able to stay out of trouble when the oil the track got oiled down and was able to bring the car home third today i think it's very important that uh, certainly he was able to take advantage of this incident right here jack baldwin blowing up the motor but you have to put yourself in a position to take advantage so hats off to you jamie you did a good job for your first race and there's one of those things that, uh, as a racing fan, you have to just feel for the driver behind the wheel. He knows he's got a second place locked up as we watch some of the action that happened behind him. Boris said right into the tire yeah. barrier. Bobby Archer into the, into the tire barrier as well. And we saw Tommy Kendall spin, although he didn't make contact and was able to get refired and come home second. That's Baldwin's motor let go. We saw him disappearing up over the rise there at the end of the Andretti straightaway. And I saw the first puff of smoke and just a few feet more, the whole uh. thing had grenaded on him. And it oiled down the back tires, obviously, as well as the track. Yeah, the, the most port version of the Canadian Ballet takes out so many good cars. <laughs> and it's just, this is, it's heartbreaking. It's one of these things that Jack will never forget, nor will Buzz McCall, I'm sure, because he, he expressed the dismay of, of having the, the bittersweet victory sure. of one car win the race. That you keep going back and saying, but I was so close. And you, you never forget it. This is just heartbreaking to work that hard to, to have driven such a great race as Jack Baldwin did. And 
to have a strong second place snatched away right at the end, it, it just seems cruel. And he didn't make a mistake by any means. Just no, the motor didn't. Didn't, uh, didn't make it all the way home. And here we're going to watch one other car come sliding in. This is the Shell Zone Mustang of Tommy Archer. So the Archer brothers, all three of their cars had problems today. Two of them crash a ton. Bill Saunders had trouble early in the going, was able to get back into right. the hunt. The nine car, the uh, Tommy Archer automobile, did get refired and get across the finish line. Then he almost went off the track again. Baldwin uh, wadding up really a $180,000 race car with that motor letting go. Chris McClure is standing by with our good friend, Mr. Baldwin. Jack Baldwin, and I, just to reiterate, not a foot wrong and not your fault. Was there any warning? None at all, none at all. It was running beautifully. The Hot Wheels Camaro was just running along and last lap, and, you know, I had it. We were going to be one, two for the team and Chevrolet and Mattel and Hot Wheels and everything. It was, it was just great. It would have been a good day for the team, and uh, it just let go. And, you know, I've had practically no engine trouble. I've never had engine trouble. I mean, I've had just beautiful, perfectly running Chevrolet engines, and, you know, in this business, every once in a while, you're going to have a little, little problem. And we had one today right good. At, I tried to drive. It almost made it, you know. <laughs> almost made it. I got, you know, I thought I could drive it in. It didn't lock up. So I thought I could drive it in. And um, the light was on. The smoke, it was shaking bad. You know, I slowed down. But uh, the oil was got, got on the back tires. There's nothing I could do about it. Just, I'm sorry. I, you know, it's, I hate to uh, scratch it. But, uh, but you know, we, I, we tried. You take it with a great equilibrium here, but is this the sort of thing for you as a racer that's going to gnaw at you for a week or two and maybe not disappear till after mid-Ohio or something? Well, uh, with a championship like this and the comp competition the way it is, I'll tell you, this this little this finishing position is going to haunt me for the rest of the season. Um, you know, when you, I don't know where I ended up, but it was probably way in the back. And point-wise, it'll hurt me, yeah, the entire distance. And, you know, I, I can't be too disappointed because, you know, the opportunity I have to be a part of this great operation in Buzz McCall's American Equipment Racing Team, but, uh, and certainly to drive the Hot Wheels Camaro is, a, is a, the greatest thing there is. But, uh, you know, in a situation like this, when you have the disappointment of almost, you know, having a good finish and, uh, you know, looking beyond, looking ahead for the championship, there is a little disappointment. But, you know, when I look at what I do have and it, it just wipes it all away. It's it's just great to be a part of this great thing. Okay, compare this with the first race, and there were changes in the rules. You got a little bit more spoiler in some of the things that were adjusted, and the gap closed down. That's not the entire reason, certainly, but, I mean, today you win a race, your team does, Chevrolet's back there, the manufacturers is tied now, and uh, it bodes well for the whole summer, I think, at least from a fan standpoint. Well, let's let's hope that it keeps going this way. We feel like uh, the, the the Mustangs uh, possibly have a little speed on us and a little aero advantage, and then there's a few little things. There's a lot of things going on there, you know. But we're we're going to work really hard, you know. We're not uh, we we at Chevrolet, the Boy Tie Boys are gonna are gonna really really work extra hard, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna battle it every lap all the time, and hopefully, you know, we'll all the races will be like this, as competitive as this, and uh, and it'll come right down to a close tight championship, and hopefully Hopefully we'll win. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. Well, good news indeed that Jack Baldwin uh, is intact himself, Bill Adam. That was a hard lick he took into the wall, and then a second contact there. These cars very, very safe, of course, and very uh, stoutly constructed. Glad to see Jack okay. Well, and as we take a look at the driver standings, after two events, Tom Kendall still leading, but Scott Pruitt has closed it up. Only five points separating the top two. Fellows, Jed Losey and Baldwin in the top five. You can see, as Jack was saying there, finishing 11th today really hurt him in the point chase. He's 24 behind. That did hurt. I, I think that was the thing that hurt him more than the impact with the wall. He would probably have been doing twice the speed and hit the wall. He would still have been angry. He wouldn't have felt that impact at all. It's just one of those things like, no, not now. Jack Baldwin takes it in good humor. The rest of the drivers who finish well take it happily today here at Most Ford Park. Scott Pruitt, your winner. Kendall, Gallus, Fellows, and Pickett round out the top five. We'll be back to meet more of the competitors who did battle here today when we continue on Prime from Most Ford Park. at Most Ford Park, Bowmanville, Ontario, just outside Toronto. The afternoon's action complete in the SCCA Trans Am Championship. One of the drivers who put on a great show and really took advantage of the Jack Baldwin problems at the end, young Jamie Gallus from Albuquerque, the very best rising star of the race this afternoon. He's standing by with Chris McClure. Jamie Gallus, what was it, a month and a half ago, we were standing in Long Beach chatting about your soon-to-emerge Trans Am career. Now your first race of 94, I don't imagine you could really honestly hope for the podium. 
Well, no, and, and, and yet we're here. So <laughs> I didn't really set a goal for this weekend. I wanted to finish the race and, and, and uh, kind of go to school on these guys, and I did. And I uh, kind of lucked out into, into third place, but I've been on the other end of that stick before, and I'll take what I can get. So well, Racing will take some back along the way, no question about that. But you have been very busy. This is no accident, no pun intended, that you were able to do well. You've tested a lot since you announced the program. Yeah, we, we, we've actually just done two days of testing, so not that much, but um, because of the caliber of the team and you know the the strength behind picket racing and our and, and our Chevy effort and and uh, and Peter Shea's entrepreneur commitment um, we were able to, to make the most out of those two days and I think it showed today tell us about the race le leading up to that final lap which was decisive for you in terms of the third place position but you're in traffic for the first time with these kinds of cars a very difficult demanding and tricky track your mental attitude going in, how it unfolded in front of you, how you felt during it. Well, on the start, I, I pretty much just wanted to, to make sure that the entrepreneur car didn't lose any positions, and I wasn't looking to, you know, make a, make a lot up on on uh, any one corner or anything, and I just wanted to to hold my position, and and uh, you know, I, I think that uh, when a when a young kid comes in and, and runs with these guys, I don't think that, you know, that they really give him much room, and so I took that into account, too. And then, I you know, I got a little pretty comfortable about the 10th lap, and, and I figured it, you know, it was just a race car, and then I started driving a little harder, but still conserving, conserving my tires, and uh, then uh, I, I just, you know, I caught up to the lead pack, and I uh, just ran behind him for a while, and a lot of people had problems. I just kept my nose clean, made a couple of moves, and uh, and here I am. So it was a. I learned a lot. I was able to run behind my boss, Greg Pickett, and uh, go to school on him a little bit, and he taught me a lot. And then uh, and then I could just barely see him through the dust as I went around, and he was spun off. So <laughs> I'm sorry for him, but I'm happy for me. Were you able to get some refreshment during the race? Some of that Cytomax? Yep, that stuff's great. You know, I. I uh, I had so much the whole day that I was, you know, I kind of just floated into the car, and then they had to strap me down. But uh, it was great through all the race, and uh, really, really gave me a good pump up for it. Didn't have any trouble with the straw. Come on, tell us the story. <laughs> well, second. it wasn't the side of Max's fault. I'll put it that way. I would I would uh, suck on the straw, and then it'd go down, and then it it kind of pump back up and squirt in my eye. So I wasn't able to drink too much during the race, but I was glad that I had it just in case I would have to. Well, it didn't affect his vision. He could see enough to get to third. And a great effort it was for young Jamie Gallus out of Albuquerque. Third place, first podium finish in his first Trans Am start in the Entrepreneur Magazine car out of the Greg Pickett shops and his teammate and car owner finishing in fifth. And for Greg Pickett, a good return to the series. There was some talk that he might retire as a driver coming into this season, that he might just take the role of car owner. But he has a lot of fun doing this, Bill. My big question of the afternoon is when Jamie Gallus goes to a strange racetrack, how does he rent a rental car when he looks to be 12 years old? <laughs> Well, he must have some numbers on the driver's license that indicate otherwise. Five. We look at the second five. Jenna Losey, Bobby Archer, George Robinson avoided trouble. John Gooding and Boris Set Gooding with a good finish. And Boris Set also gets credit for 10th spot there, uh, considering the problems he had. He gets credit. Got across the line, evidently. Uh, 40 laps shown, completed by Set on our scoring monitor. Jack Baldwin, Tommy Archer, Tim McAdam, Randy Ruhlman, and Brian Richards, 11th through 15th as we take you through the running order. Good effort for Richards, who started at the back, the Canadian chauffeur out of Vancouver uh, avoided trouble today and uh, got a lap down but that's all and comes up with a nice top 15 finish here at the High and Zells Trans Am at Mostport Park. Donald Sack in one of the Oldsmobiles of the field. R.J. Valentine who had problems at about the, the 23 or 24 lap mark. Dale Phelan. Dorsey Schrader who was a contender had a tire let go in a big way up that back straightaway. Yeah. Rick Dittman rounding out the top 20. The other Oldsmobile mounted driver. That back stretch, that Andretti straightaway where Dorsey had the tire problem. That's also where Baldwin's motor let go. Is that unbelievably stressful on these cars? Well, it, it really is because you're, you're pulling not only on a long straight, but it's an uphill straight, so that poor engine is just working as hard as possible. Tim McAdam, an old pal of mine, finished 21st, and Tim will never know how close I came to peeling a couple of letters off his car, and I just can <laughs> slide into this thing without a problem. Bill Adams looking for a ride in this series, folks. If you know a car owner who's got a free seat, he'd love to take you up on it. Bob Patch, Clint Welding, Bill Saunders, and Ray Kong, who had trouble right off the start. Uh, rounding out the top 25 the field here today. We're going to go back now. This is a really interesting in many respects, but the race was bracketed by a bad crash at the start, 
and a bad crash at the end. Here's the green flag. The leaders go under the starter stand, and we took a little look back further in the field. Bill, you saw it first, the dust kicking up. Yeah, but again, inexperience. We saw so many examples of wonderful talent today. Well, here is an example of inexperience on the gas way, way too early when there wasn't room to do it. Watch the green car. Watch him up the inside as he tries to hit the brakes and avoid the car that he's catching very quickly. Puts it sideways on cold tires, slams the wall, and then all of a sudden, the track is blocked. And that was where Bill Saunders, the third Archer car, got in right. trouble. Ironically, we, we had a little confusion at the start with the car numbers. Ray Kong and Rick McCormick, the two green Jinsana team cars, were the two cars involved, and they bracketed. There's we see the, the Kong automobile into the wall hard, and Saunders was the meat and the sandwich there, and his red Archer Brothers Mustang came to grief early on, too, although they did get him back on the racetrack for a time here at Bo Sport Park. We'll be back to wrap things up for you today on Prime, the 1994 SCCA Trans Am Tour Round 2. Complete today, your winner, Scott Pruitt. We'll be back.